I think somebody's going to finally see when we have these standards develop that there's gold in those hills. I mean, look at all the people that have flooded to the cannabis industry. And it is now a thriving industry that is respected. Welcome to the Tiny House Lifestyle Podcast, the show where you learn how to plan, build, and live the tiny lifestyle. I'm your host, Ethan Waldman, and this is episode 181 with Janet Ohm. Janet and I have been talking for a while, and we decided that it's finally time to pull back the curtain on the efforts that she has been working on for the last several months and do an interview on the Tiny House Lifestyle Podcast. Janet is the founder, president, and treasurer of Tiny House Alliance USA and is currently leading an exploratory initiative to develop new global building standards with ASTM. Now, before your eyes glaze over, I encourage you to stick with this show because Janet does a great job of explaining what ASTM International is, what standards are, how they would impact the tiny house building industry, dwellers, uh, DIYers, not just in the United States, not just in North America, but across the entire world. It's a really exciting effort. I think there's a lot of potential here, and we need more people to get involved. We need advocates. We need stakeholders to join, join not the fight, but join the process. And I'm excited about it. So I hope you stick around for this interview with Janet Thom. I want to tell you about something that I think will be super helpful as you plan, design, and build your tiny house. Tiny House Decisions is the guide that I wish I had when I was building my tiny house. It comes in three different packages to help you on your unique tiny house journey. And if you're struggling to just figure out the systems for your tiny house, you know, like how you're going to heat it, how you're going to plumb it, you know, what construction technique are you going to use, like sips or stick framing or steel framing. Tiny House Decisions will take you through all these processes systematically and help you come up with a design that works for you. Right now, I'm offering 20% off any package of Tiny House Decisions. For listeners of the show, you can head over to thetinyhouse.net slash THD to learn more and use the coupon code TINY at checkout for 20% off any package. Again, that's thetinyhouse.net slash THD and use the coupon code TINY for 20% off. I am here with Janet Thome. Janet is the founder, president, and the treasurer of Tiny House Alliance USA. Janet Thome is leading an exploratory initiative to develop new global building standards with ASTM. Janet is also the founder of Tiny Portable Cedar Cabins. She is a tiny home sales consultant representing builders across the country to fulfill the needs of clients that want to go tiny or looking for a community or legal place to live. Finally, Janet has a small tiny home village in Washington State and loves dogs. Janet Thome, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. You're very welcome. Thank you so much for being here. I know you're you're very busy working on this exciting opportunity for the tiny house movement. Um, I was hoping we could just start like really high level um, for listeners because I, I think, I mean, I didn't really know what the ASTM was until I started following this initiative. So can you explain, you know, what is the ASTM? ASTM International is a standard developer. They're a nonprofit and they started in 1898. And how it started was a group of scientists and engineers got together when the railroad was going across the country and they did the first standard on steel for safety reasons. ASTM has been developing standards for 120 years. Mm -hmm. We have, they have relationships with 150 countries and they're the, one of the largest anti-accredited standards developers in the world. They have published over 13,000 standards. And as of 2018, I think 40% of the ICC building codes are ASTM reference standards. Wow. Okay. So that means that like the ICC building codes basically are like, is it just like word for word, the, the standard, or does it just kind of reference what the ASTM says? 
usually a, a standard is kind of the how to in a building code. Mm -hmm. So a good example is a code will tell you that you need something, but a standard tells you how to do it in the simplest terms. Interesting. Okay. So a code tells you that you need your walls to be R, a minimum of R30, and a standard says um, it has to be two by six studs or sips that are this thick using these different materials, yada, yada, yada. Good example. Okay. And there are like six types of, of ASTM standards. It'd be a test method, classification, terminology, guide, specification, or a practice. Okay. A great uh, real world example would be cannabis. Okay. Cannabis has a committee with ASTM and they are, it's very exciting. If, if, if everybody knows that industry, very similar to our industry, kind of a rogue group, don't regulate me kind of group. Who does that sound yeah. like? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, uh, and what's impressive is they have 900 members in 30 countries and they have nine technical committees and they have 75 standards in development right now. Okay, so what's, what's so exciting about this industry is they now have standards for test methods, cultivation, dispensing, lab testing, analytical me methods, quality assurance, devices, security, packaging, pharmaceuticals, uh, government liaison, and this is global. It's very exciting. And this is the potential that the tiny house industry has mm -hmm. is to become an industry to create conformity without borders. Okay. Can you say more about that? Like what, can you say more about what the opportunity is for, for tiny houses around the world with, with these standards? We don't, right, right now we're using RV standards. So mm -hmm. the RV industry feels that we are co-opting their standards. RVs are usually meant for temporary use where a tiny house is, people want a tiny house as a residence. And with this crisis right now with needing 7 million affordable housing units yesterday, tiny houses could be an answer for affordable housing. And it's very needed. And uh, so we don't have a standard. So we have a mosaic of rules and laws all over the country, and we have no uniformity. Perfect example, in Minnesota, you can build to a HUD code, modular, or site build. They don't allow an, the park model standard, even though a lot of the builders step up the minimum requirements of a, that an RV stipulates. Because as you know, a lot of the builders are built with, it could be basically a house, the quality mm -hmm. of the builders are out there. But there's not trust because we don't have our own standards. And so we're, we're you know, kind of pitted here and pitted there. And, you know, like in California, there's been a lot of great progress, you know, with tiny houses in a backyard, or you can do it to an ANSI or an FPA standard. But then other parts of the country that are more conservative don't want that approach. But it couldn't be a better time with a lot of the states getting rid of the single family dwelling stipulation and, and they're trying to find uh, solutions for housing mm -hmm. and they're desperate for it. And who, who's going to mandate these standards are going to be the city council members, the mayors, the county commissioners. That's who's on our side to get these uh, standards developed. Mm -hmm. Because as you know, if you've ever looked into this, they will spend two or three years in think tanks and affordable housing summits. And we all come back empty handed from the meetings because we don't, we still don't have our standards that, you know, can, uh, which will create financing for us, which is very needed. And, and, mm. and, and mainstream insurance, insurance is a buyer's market right now. That's pretty easy, but the lending situation is still a problem because it is considered temporary use. Right. Yeah. No, that's, that is true. We're 10, I mean, we're like over 10 years into the modern tiny house movement here and it's still very difficult to get a loan to build a tiny house. It really is. I mean, Liberty Bank of Utah is one of the best, but unfortunately uh -huh. they cannot give the loan uh, until after it's built. And the mm. builders in a situation where they've, they maybe they've gotten 20% down, but they can't build a tiny house for 20% down. So they they have to float that money and, you know, they have to, 
get a line of credit. So I think somebody's going to finally see when we have these standards develop that there's gold in those hills. I mean, look yeah. at all the people that have flooded to the cannabis industry, people with a lot of uh, financial capabilities. And it is now a thriving industry that is respected because of the uniformity. Yeah. And the tiny house industry has that same opportunity here. Can you speak to how, you know, how this process works from start to finish and kind of where we are in it? We have been speaking to new business development with ASTM since uh, February. I've okay. been speaking to them previous to them because I had to show them first our need for standards. And I think we are the poster child of an industry that needs standards because that's what ASTM does. What ASTM does is they bring experts of an industry together and they go through a, they, they create a forum to facilitate a fair process uh, to write, develop voluntary consensus standards. So where we're at, which is kind of exciting, is they already have 140 technical committees, but we do not quite fit in the existing committees that they already have. So who we've been talking to is new business development to get us ready to send our proposal to their governing board that is called COTCO, and they're the ones that grant new committees. So our long goal here is to be granted a brand new committee just for tiny houses. We're not going to be just doing a standard and then we're done. This will be a, this will be a committee that will go on indefinitely. And the exciting thing is we will develop standards and maintain them. And if you can imagine the, the excitement of shipping to Canada, exporting from Australia, having the same certification, having the same way they're built, where we address all life, health, fire safety, road safety regulations. It's quite exciting, the opportunity. And we call it exploratory because we, you know, we, we, haven't, we haven't received approval yet. And so we're hoping that we're going to get approved. Uh, we just have a few more meetings we have to attend. And then they will present our um, proposal to COTCO. A few other or, uh, industries that they've developed is nanotechnology, 3D printing, and also commercial going into space, believe it or not. It's very exciting, uh, the opportunity here. And so we're hoping that if we do get the committee, we will be granted a brand new committee and then we'll, off, we'll elect officers. Will there be a main committee? We'll have a co-chair, a chair, a member secretary, and a secretary. Uh, we write bylaws. And then each type of work that needs to be divided, we have different subcommittees. For instance, we want to do a subcommittee on tiny houses on wheels. Mm -hmm. We want to do a subcommittee on tiny houses on foundation. To uh, Then we want to have a, a standard on certification. And then another standard, a, a, another committee on microgrid utilities, and one on tiny home communities. Very important. So basically, the desire is to standardize our entire process so we can integrate all the information and create uniformity to integrate the jurisdiction, the consumer, and the builder all at, together. And that saves the jurisdictions a lot of money, too, because you can imagine how many, how, how many calls are they fielding a day? Do you accept tiny houses? If you look around, how many summits are occurring? How many think tanks are occurring? But the, but the missing part is the standards that we don't have. Mm. And then um, we, they put out a notice for the different countries that want to be involved. And we have to use uh, the essential requirements of ANSI, which means the standards have to be written uh, with openness, a lack of dominance, balance, coordination, harmonization, notifications of standards, we have to publish our intentions. We have to have, we have, to have all views and objections have to be dealt with. Uh, we have consensus vote, appeals. It is, goes through a public comment stage. Every voice is very, very important. We, we need stakeholders from the end users, the builders, material suppliers, lenders, insurance, we need uh, government officials. We need the third parties. We need anybody that has a vested interest that will be affected by our standards development. That is the beauty. 
coming together where we all write this together. ASTM does not write the standards for us. They facilitate a fair and open consensus process. And that is the beauty. Because you cannot come in with the, with the most amount of money and, and be the dominant force. One of the most important essential requirements is a lack of dominant position in the standards development. You can't come in with you know, millions of dollars and say, I, my voice is more important than the DIYer. Mm-hmm. We're keeping very much in mind what the DIYers want because they're a lot of our stakeholders and it's very, very important to represent the DIYers. Yeah, that's that's really exciting. I, it or it's it's so high level, or it's just it, it has the potential to touch so many things that I think it's it's a little bit hard to conceptualize exactly what it is. Um, would the standards, for example, speak to I don't know how to safely ventilate a tiny house or what the minimum insulation is for a tiny house? Um, Absolutely. Okay. Uh, yes, it, yes. Like for instance, on the tiny house on wheels standard, it, uh-huh. that will address all all life, health, fire safety, road safety. In fact, NFPA will, as you know, when we get this rolling, if and when they will come in and help us. That's the beauty. We don't have mm-hmm. to reinvent the wheel. We we can reference other standards. You know, we don't have to start from ground zero. Uh, we can reference other standards, and obviously, all. The most important is life, health, fire, safety, and road safety. Uh And we need to do is we're going to also do a standard for tiny houses on a chassis, which is very important. We're we're seeing so seeing so many unsafe things happening Uh uh, that we keep hearing about. I don't know if you hear about that a lot, Ethan, but you know people you know buying tiny houses and they don't have enough axles, they can't move their house, or the house is falling apart, or someone didn't use a vapor barrier there's just it's it's a constant problem and you know we there's so many people that want to be in this industry so it's just time for us to grow up and become a substantial industry this gives us an opportunity to grow as an industry and have a fair and open market and and create housing for people that are desperately in need yeah so who are the stakeholders right now and and who are you looking for or who is the process looking for to, to be represented? We have uh, a lot of the, uh, we have a, a lot of the third parties agencies that are with us, which is very exciting because they all have experience in standards development. They do the testing inspection certification for modular manufactured homes, part mm-hmm. models, and they, they understand that process. I mean, these are, like uh, PFS Tico and Radco, they have you know forty four. They have thirty five to forty four years in the industry. Very very exciting. We have a lot of different builders. Uh, we have a lender as a stakeholder. We have different countries that are involved. You know, the Australian Tiny House Association. We have the New Zealand Tiny House Association. Uh, Tiny Home Alliance Canada. We have uh, the Washington State Tiny House Association. And many, so many lifestyle tiny home communities. I don't think who else? Um, just a, a modular builders. Mm-hmm. We have SG Blocks, which is an amazing modular builder that had the very first ICC tested ESR for container homes. Mm-hmm. So the expertise that we have is amazing. We have P- PSE consulting engineers. Uh, Nabil Taha is an engineer that has 40, over 40 years experience in structural engineering. Mm-hmm. And so we have, we have the architects. We have Paul Nayulasi with uh, Diggs Prefab, and he's, he practices architecture and has a manufacturing facility in, in California. So the, our, I mean, our standards will obviously be only as good as the, as the, as the people that write them. Mm-hmm. And in fact, one thing I, I didn't get to finish is when I was describing the committees is each committee will have a task group. The task group will do the heavy lifting and actually write the standards. And uh, that's, we, we really have the quality of people to get this done. Mm-hmm. And that's going to take the architects and it's going to take the structural engineers and it's going to take the builders that have already been building these for, for a long time that know how it needs, they, they, know, it's, they know it's missing, you know? Mm-hmm. 
can you speak to this standards process and and how that maybe um goes hand in hand or or interacts with other kind of legal efforts around tiny houses okay so just say that again just um how how this ASTM relates you explained it a little bit before of how it it relates to to ICC codes and things like that well one thing that we're going to do possibly in our proposal and our proposal basically is just we got together and wrote a proposal to present to Kotco as as in once the committee if and when it is officially approved will have to be rewritten and balloted and voted on again Mm -hmm. but one thing that we we do want to do is we want to perhaps write a standard that complements and supplements a Pinnix Q tiny house. Uh, Pinnix Q tiny house was approved for inclusion in the 2018 IRC. They pro- provide regulations for standards for tiny houses on a foundation, 400 square feet or less. And so not to be in conflict with that code, we have to do this carefully because that code has been, a, that has been adopted in more than half the country already. It's been, mm-hmm. It was very, very well received. I call that our crowning achievement for the industry. And what we want to do is how we're not in conflict with that is we create a standard that meets the code requirements and complements it without being in conflict with it. Mm -hmm. In other words, Mm -hmm. we could add diagrams. We could add testing. We could add a checklist for inspectors. We could do a white paper. And then we can take that standard. And then we could create a new standard and reference that for the rest of the world, not to be in conflict, because most of the world does not have an appendix to tiny house. Oh, they don't have a standard for tiny houses on a foundation. So and this is going to be um, that is that is one thing. Another thing that's very important for you to know is we've got some major uh, letters of endorsement for. In the state from the state of Colorado, mm-hmm. from Chris mm-hmm. Kennedy and from Kathy Kipp from the House of Representatives in Colorado, endorsing what we're doing. What this does, they want, they want to create housing. And what's really exciting is Chris Kennedy is actually promoting the use of definitely the tiny houses on wheels. So that's very important. So how that ties in is a, is a standard can be adopted into a law or, like I said, a model act or land use. And that's this, so that's how these, standards become adopted and approved and become real for our industry and we mm-hmm. have we're going to have some help because because that way they don't have to figure out if you if you ever if you just google the amount of meetings that are occurring across the country trying to solve this issue and 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 trying to find you know what works i mean a perfect example is uh, sitka alaska they did this amazing ordinance uh in 2019 and I talked to the planner. It was pretty exciting to see. And he, he told me he was trying to do some research and he couldn't find anything. It was, it's, all the information is all over the place. Mm-hmm. So he wrote mm-hmm. an ordinance where you could build a tiny house on, a, on wheels from the floor joist up to Appendix Q and have a third party certified that it adheres to that chassis, to an engineered you know, trailer. Okay. And that was very innovative. And that sounds, and it sounds very simple, doesn't it? But yeah, it, that wasn't yeah. out there before, you know, and so that's how this is going to help the standards, because then we have something to provide. Another perfect example, a Washington State tiny house by uh, there was a, a tiny house bill and they, they in the bill, they mandated that Washington State create building codes for tiny houses. And I actually talked to the code officials and he told me that tiny houses on wheels made him want to pull his hair out. So he didn't really, they didn't, you know, usually code officials see, they see, they want to deal with structures. They don't want to do, they don't want to deal with vehicles, which a tiny house on wheels is a vehicle. And so they ended up writing, they ended up amending and adopting Appendix Q for Washington State. And then you can build a tiny house on wheels to a modular code, which is the local building code of Washington State. But they really didn't, they don't really have, a, but you have to have that engineered. So that's a lot of extra money. So 
we that's why if we had the standard, we could give that to Washington and say and said, hey, this is the standard that you can use. Got it. Got it. I'd like to tell you a little bit more about Tiny House Decisions, my signature guide and the resource that I wish I had when I was building my tiny house. It starts with the big decisions, which is, you know, should you build a tiny house yourself or with help? Um, is a is a pre-built shell a good idea? Um, is a house on wheels better than on the ground and what works better for you? Um, deciding on the overall size, deciding on whether you should use custom plans or pre-made plans, different types of trailers and more. Uh, then in, the, in part two, we get into the system. So heat, water, showers, hot water, toilets, electrical, refrigeration, ventilation. And we're only two thirds of the way through the book at this point. From systems, we go into construction decisions, talking about nails versus screws, SIPs versus stick framed versus advanced framing versus metal framing. Uh, we talk about how to construct a subfloor, sheathing, roofing materials, insulation, windows, flooring, kitchen. I know I'm just reading off the table of contents, but I just want to give you a sense of how comprehensive Tiny House Decisions is. Uh, it's a total of 170 pages. It contains tons of full color drawings, diagrams, and resources. And it really is the guide that I wish I had when I was building my tiny house. Right now, I'm offering 20% off any package of tiny house decisions using the coupon code TINY when you head over to thetinyhouse.net slash THD. That's THD for tiny house decisions. Again, that's coupon code TINY when you check out at thetinyhouse.net slash THD. What's the timeline that... Um that you expect this to kind of roll out on? Are we talking about a year, many years, decades? How long will this take? No, no, no. So not. I'm hoping that our committee will be approved in the next two months. Okay. And what I have heard is that usually they can, you can develop standards between nine to 18 months. And the beauty is, is these committees do not hold up the work of another committee. In other words, let's say this, the tiny house on wheels standard is finished first. The tiny house on community standards in development will not hold up anything because they can all be published at different times. That's another beautiful, beautiful thing. So I think that more than anything is just going through this process, making sure that everyone is you know, notified that we're doing this and that they're welcomed. Every you know, voice is important. So that's the longer process is getting it started and getting this right. approved rather than the actual developing the standards. And I've, I've heard from both from ICC and NFPA who also are their standards developers. And they say that the process is, you know, they, I mean, I, I mean, ASTM has been doing this for 120 years, so they really know what they're doing. And with the online capability now, it's pretty exciting because people can work uh, at their own pace and online and it's, it's going to be pretty exciting. And the other beautiful thing about working with this globally is we kind of ran into something with Australia. Australia sees the standard development a little bit different than we do. And, that, you know, they, they, how they see it is they want the same standard for tiny houses on wheels and on foundation. And, but a lot of the builders really want to use the NFPA and the ANSI standards or the RV standards. So, but the beauty is we figured out how okay, Australia, we can all have what we want because all, all Australia has to do is she can, they can do the standards from the floor joist up the same, and then they can adopt sections of the tiny house on wheels standard. That's the beauty of this. You can, you, you can see standards as like building blocks. You can adopt sections and AS team standards can be adopted or immediately after publication, they can be amended to fit country's needs cool so the icc so uh, yeah i'm still like figuring out and understanding uh these different acronyms these different organizations so icc which is the international code council do they also create standards yes they do actually okay and in fact they have uh there's two new they have a new they had a new committee that started two years ago called the offsite and Modular Constructed Standards Committee. Okay. And actually, as tiny houses were first excluded from that committee, 
then included, and then after, and they've been working on it for a couple of years. And then when they presented a proposal to one of the hearings, the building officials voted it down. Mm-hmm. And so now they have a state, now they have removed all the terminology of tiny houses, tiny homes, and appendix Q from the standards, which is really not a negative thing because a tiny house can still be built to a modular code, which is basically just the local, you know, if wherever it's shipped to, it's that local, it's the local building codes of that mm-hmm. jurisdiction that it's shipped to. Yeah. So we didn't lose anything there, but it just kind of shows you where the the building code officials still see tiny houses on wheels as an RV. And that's what the co-chair told me, I mean, excuse me, the, the chair told me that the code officials still see tiny houses on wheels as an RV. So that's why I love ASTM because we, you know, we don't have to wait through a, a, a code cycle change that happens every three years or wait till a state, you know, or, I mean, some state, they're all the different states are on different types of different years of the IRC. Right. And they don't have to wait for that state to adopt the, that new IRC. So, yes, and they do, like I said, they do develop standards and they are going to probably in collaboration work with us when we do the standards because there are some standards that we might want to have referenced in, in two building codes and they can help a lot of other countries. Right. Right. Do you see this as as duplicative in any way of of like what ICC has done at all? Not at all, because ICC. Okay, like if you can't mention the word tiny house, tiny home, or appendix to tiny house, but you could be included, Mm -hmm. that's really not being specific. And we're going to be at ASTM. We're going to be one hundred percent specific. So there's where it, and I've actually talked to the director of standards and I asked him that question because that was asked of me. And this is what the answer he said, because you really can't tell if a standard is a duplication until it's written. Mm. And then what happens is when you, when you, a standard is written, you put out what is called a pins notification. If you want it to be adopted in, in jurisdictions and to be ANSI approved. Right. And so you have to fill out the name of the standard and then there's a public comment stage and that what happens in is if they they find a duplication, then the two standard developers will delegate. And that's how you avoid a duplication. I mean, ICC and ASTM, we've been in a lot of communication regarding our standards development. I've had a meeting with ICC and ASTM regarding this. And I think there's a lot of room for collaboration with both standard developers. Cool. Cool. Who will and who will own the standards? Like, and will will they be free for people to read, or will they be something that's kind of marketed and, and needs to be purchased? Well, this is how ASTM. There's there's no cost to us to de- for them to develop our standards, except that we have to join to become a member, and it's only seventy five dollars a year. So it's a pretty amazing. Uh, uh, Dale, but nobody can really sell the standards except for ASTM. Okay. And that's how they recoup their investment and their time with us. And, but they do have a free reading room though. Like a physical location where you can go to read them? No, I think it's online. It's, it's, yeah, it's, oh, I guess if you're in uh, Pennsylvania, you, you can, but there's a free, you know, access online. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Cause I'm just thinking of like, you know, cause you talked about how y- these these standards will be applicable to DIY builders as well. And I'm just imagining a DIY builder, you know, usually the, to buy these code books and things is, is prohibitively expensive. The pricing is usually more geared towards like governments and companies buying access. No, I don't think they're, they're actually, I haven't really, I don't think they're actually all that expensive. And okay, one of the standards that we want to develop was, is a global assurance program, a, a mm-hmm. quality assurance program, which every builder, when they are certified by a third party, that's one of the requirements that they have, you know, how, how the tiny house is built. And, and that is going to be a very, uh, for, help the affordability of tiny houses, because if we do a standard like that, that will save the builder a lot of money, because if they don't have that, there's a lot more work they have to do with their third party. 
and the third party will approve this global assurance manual that each manufacturer has to have. And so I don't think it's going to be that expensive. Mm -hmm. I don't know how, I don't know how this is going to work. I mean, is the, and usually a DIYer might want to be certified by a third party and that could possibly be included in their, in their cost. You know, all, everything is up in the air. I can't, this is an example of what could happen. Right. But obviously it's not been written yet. So I don't uh, know how to answer that until it's, it's done. Okay. But we do have them in mind and we do have some, some, some definite DIYers in our stakeholders group and that, like I said, they're very, very important to our industry. Yeah. So what, what's the best way for our listeners, um, be they DIY builders or tiny house dwellers, um, or even people working with professional builders, you know, what's the best way for them to follow this process and, and support it flash, or do they want to go one step further and get involved? Maybe you could talk about, you know, there's, there's different levels of involvement. Okay. I mean, you can, well, have them contact me, Janet at tinyhouseallianceusa.org, and I will put them on the stakeholders list. And then they can, I, I mean, I'm, I'm also well, well, you know, willing to have a call, kind of catch people up, have a one-on-one -on -one talk with people. I really enjoy getting people up to speed with this. And uh, they can decide how deep they want to be involved in this do they just want to join the main committee so they can vote do they want to be an officer elected do they want to be a, in the task group a lot of the people are so busy they don't even really have time to even come to our meetings they're like call me later when this is done and because the, and they're the people that want to help write it so there's all these different levels of involvement and everyone yeah. can make that decision that's best for them Cool. So it sounds like it's it's kind of an open process. Nobody's excluded. Anybody who wants to be a part of it can can be a part of it at this point. No one's excluded at all. Not at all. Very cool. Very cool. In fact, I mean, stakeholders are people that are for and against it. So, you know, yeah. there's it, because they want ASTM needs to hear opposing views to make their decision. Got it. So that's welcomed as well. And are there are there stakeholders that are against it? Um. Yes. <laughs> That might be another pod that might be another podcast though. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Um what haven't I asked you? What what uh, you know, mm. what are you most excited about recently? Because I know like I'm I'm on the stakeholders list. I get the emails. Right. Um it seems like there are new developments that happen pretty regularly. What you know, we're talking uh in mid September twenty twenty one. You know, what's what happened recently and what are you looking forward to in the next couple of months? Well, I'm pretty excited about the letters of endorsement that we got from Chris Kennedy and Kathy Kipp because I mean, you know, the beauty is, I mean, they could, their Colorado is all already showing the signs, they'll probably be the first state to adopt our standards. And a pretty good, a good example, Salt Lake City just adopted a standard in a draft form that the ICC offsite and modular standards committee uh, developed before it was even published, which is pretty exciting because of their need for affordable housing there. So yeah, there is an urgency in affordable housing that, that it, the, I think the window could not be better. And the fact that uh, ASTM is kind of, because of COVID they've gone virtual as well. So I'm excited about so many things. I'm excited about the endorsements. I'm excited about the, the level of quality stakeholders that I have, they're supporting this. We have United Tiny House Association. We have 39,000 members that support this initiative. We have uh, a lot of people that want to see this happen. And so, and every day I'm getting, a, you know, someone that wants to tell me that they're uh, going to help us. I've got a new stakeholder from Finland, which is very exciting. A mechanical engineer. Cool. I don't know. I think, I think, I guess the last thing we haven't talked about is maybe like what, 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 how do we see the future when this is all said and done? Sure. Yeah. Let's, let's go, let's go out to Let, the let's future. Look, let's look at that. Let's look at that future. Okay. That future, uh, once again, I'll, I'll compare it to the cannabis industry. We will have mainstream financing. 
because, you know, as I was listening, listening to a video just recently about the cannabis standards, I really urge you to do that, Ethan, you'll enjoy those. They're talking about how now that cannabis is becoming a standard as having standards is attracting the people in the industry with huge amount of financial input for the industry. And I feel the same thing will happen for the tiny houses. Someone's going to finally realize, oh my gosh, there is, so, there is you know, gold in those hills. Mm-hmm. And get into our industry and let's, let's have some financing and have some, you know, it'll also, you know, hopefully, I, I mean, I, for me personally, I love an open market because it keeps everything a little bit more affordable. Uh, I yeah. don't like exclusivity. And I really like an open market feel. And I, I see that we're going to be, one important, very important standard that we want to do is the tiny home community developments, because I think the future of affordable housing will be shared infrastructure. Yeah. Place for tiny houses to go to. And what's really exciting is there's already, already standards, NFPA standards that exist for tiny home communities. And so we don't look at, once again, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. So, and then microgrid utilities is shows you how to connect tiny houses in a cluster formation for utilities. So what I see is that we'll finally close the gaps of the gray areas mm-hmm. that have plagued our industry where, I mean, where can you fact check what is really real and what's correct? You can't with our industry because of our mosaic of laws and uh, it, I want to trade all those hours that the, the officials are spending on summits and the think tanks and answering the, filling the calls on saying, yes, here's our tiny house ordinance. Yes, it's allowed because we have faith in the life, health, fire safety, and road safety. One other thing that I would really feel like is important that we do is we create a guide for the uh, jurisdiction that will mirror the global assurance program that show the jurisdictions what we're doing in our industry. Mm-hmm. In other words, you know, the, the manufacturer needs to get a world manufacturer ID number. They need to become a dealer. They need to, you know, have that chassis engineered, you know, things like that. It has, it's all lined up for the jurisdiction in a uniform, integrated information, uh, tribal knowledge, they call it, I think. So that's what I'm looking forward to. An industry that's grown up. Yeah. Well, um, thank you for your effort in, in doing this work and, and kind of hurting these cats to get this industry on that path to growing up. Yes, thank you. It's, ha- it's had some challenges. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure. I, and, you know, it, I think I'm still just struck by, I think it's kind of cool that, you know, nobody can say, hey, this, we're being excluded or like, we don't like this idea because if they don't, they can become a stakeholder and express that. I think, and I think that's pretty cool. Absolutely. And if you don't like the proposal, we, you know, one thing we did here, they, they said the proposal was too broad. Well, you know, if we, it has to be broad, we're going to get a committee that lasts indefinitely. Like, mm-hmm. you know, cannabis has 75 standards in development. It's pretty exciting. The opportunity. Yeah. And the other exciting, exciting thing is, you know, what haven't we thought of? I mean, why does a tiny house always have to be on a foundation or a chassis? What is that? Is there something in between, like a retractable trailer or something? Look at the look at the cost of a chassis. Yeah, there are some companies doing it, and it's right. really exciting. I know that. And what's exciting is, you know, ASTM standards are not just always about the construction, or they're about lifestyle changes. There, I want to do in the future standards that for multi generational aging in place. Yeah. You know, wonderful standards for ADA compliant houses, 3D printing, because ASTM has done a lot of standards for 3D printing and we could do a standard for a 3D printing tiny house. So there is room for innovation. There's room for invention. There's room for future thinking. In fact, if, if someone out there has a standard that would fit a tiny house you know, for the tiny house industry, we can actually write a standard for their product in our standard development. How exciting mm-hmm. is that? So that's what I want people to get excited about because why do we have to just always put it on a chassis and then you have to put it on a foundation? Sometimes you have to put it on a chassis and a foundation. Well, 
And there, I want to also mention we have some pretty cool um, stakeholders that have some innovative foundation systems. There is a product called Diamond Peer Foundation, and uh, all ground, the stop digging ground screw screws. Mm-hmm. Both these companies are stakeholders, and what's really amazing about these foundation is they can be a tiny house can be movable, permanent, and mobile again because these foundations mm-hmm. are movable. So that way we can keep our hybrid st- status. Yes, we're uh, we are hybrid, but we can we can meet the requirements of a jurisdiction, and then later if we want to move again, we can move. Yeah, and we can t- remove the pins from the Diamond Pier Foundation, and uh, off you go. I'm sure it's not as simple as that, but anyway, I just, if anybody's listening here and you've got an invention and you have something you want to create, it's time for us to be inventive. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Um, well, Janet, um, thank you so much. I I loved that, you know, we were talking, doing our standard sound check and, and you explained how to pronounce your last name is like the word home with a T in front of it. Thome. And there's T, tiny home. It's right in your name. <laughs> I know. It's pretty, I, I never even thought about that until someone pointed that out to me recently. M- must be a destiny thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I love this industry. And I really, really want to help the phone calls that I get every week, you know, saying that I'm being priced out of my rental home mm-hmm. or I want a mortgage or I you know, I'm going to, I'm 80 years old and I'm going to go live in my car. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I want to be a part of that solution. And I feel like it's going to take all of us to be a part of the solution. Yeah. And I feel like ASTM is going to give us a path to create. It, it's, I, I feel like it's going to change the, uh, the face of affordable housing forever. Cool. Cool. Well, one last thing that I, I would love to ask you about is just your own tiny house village. Can you, can you tell me about it and what, you know, how many houses are there and, and what's it like? Yeah. I, I live in a smallest incorporated town in Washington state. It's called Marlin. It comes up as Krupp. The population is, uh, I think 50 people and we probably have more feral cats here than we have people. <laughs> and it, it's very sweet. I have two tiny houses. One is on wheels. One is on like a little ADU. And then I have a little lot with someone brought the little tiny house and it's really cool because we're all, you know, I love living this way because everyone has their own sovereign place. We're all different ages and we all, we're kind of loners. Basically it's funny. We're all kind of, we, we like to keep to ourselves. but if you need a ride to town or if you need something or we're there for each other and everyone, you know, has their own cooking, sleeping, you know, like wash your clothes independently. Nice. But I think it's just a wonderful way to live. It, it, it really is. I, I just enjoy it so much. And it's beautiful here. And we all love animals and we have chickens and it's so exciting to have chickens. They're, uh, chickens are ha- really a happy animal to watch. And uh, yeah. yeah, we have feral cats, obviously. And it's a sweet little town, middle, middle of nowhere. And I'm very happy here. Awesome. Well, Janet Thome, thank you so much for being a guest on the show. I really appreciate it. Hey, thank you so much, Ethan. Thank you so much to Janet Thome for being a guest on the show today. You can find the show notes, including a complete transcript and a lot of supplemental information. Janet publishes long, researched, and cited blog posts about her efforts, and I'll link to a few of them that help explain where things are. Uh, all at the show notes page at thetinyhouse.net slash 181. Again, that's thetinyhouse.net slash 181. Well, that's all for this week. I'm your host, Ethan Waldman, and I'll be back next week with another episode of the Tiny House Lifestyle Podcast.